Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Don Means, Jr., Director, Operations and Infrastructure Center. Well, hello, everybody. Hopefully, you're having a fantastic time. It has been great for me. It was great to hear uh, the director, Anonymous Sherman, and uh, the other center directors. Um, if I get the slides up. I talked, I'm going to talk, talk to you a little bit about the Operations and Infrastructure Center. Some of this may be familiar to you, some of it may not. Um, you know, I'm the director. I have a, a senior technical advisor, Dr. Sharina Chan, who pulls a technical thread not only across the center, but across the whole agency to make sure that we're aligning um, our uh, capabilities to operational relevance and making sure that we understand operational risk when we r roll it out into the environment. Um, we have Ms. Tanisha McMillan, who is our uh, brand spanking new Endpoint Customer Service Directorate Executive. She is doing Fourth Estate Network Optimization. Uh, she also runs our special access programs and classified, uh, highly classified um, capabilities and also runs our global service desk. And so in many ways, uh, the face of the agency is we bring people to a productive state. We have uh, Chris Pajikowski, who is our transport services executive. Uh, when you hear uh, things like JADC2 and JWCC, uh, he is the lead for providing that ubiquitous transport that's going to get data where it needs to go uh, from cloud to edge. And then I've got Joe Wassel, who is the cyberspace operations executive. Um, if you think about this uh, large enterprise, uh, enough fiber to wrap around the world twice, uh, you know, the third largest IPv4 network, uh, second only to China and the United States. How do, you, uh, how do you defend it? How do you operate it? That is in Joe Wassel's uh, job jar as, long, as well as a hand and glove partnership with all of our combatant commands. Uh, he has commanders so that we can understand their uh, requirements and meet uh, deliver capability at the speed of mission. Um, next slide. And so a little bit more detail about the different uh, directorates. Um, uh, Tanisha, she's got this, the Special Mission Services Office. And if you think about National Leadership Command capabilities, Senior Leader Communications, uh, she's heavily involved in that, as well as the Compartment Enterprise Services Office, which is where special access IT, if you think about you know, what are, what are the crown jewels of the nation? What, da what data needs to be delivered uh, at the highest level so that we can make sure that we are making the command and control decisions that we need? Uh, that's provided uh, by that Compartment and Enterprise Services Office. Uh, I also mentioned Fourth Estate Network Optimization. She's got the Program Management Office in her shop, as well as the Global Service Desk, and um, uh, what we call DOD Net, which is going to be the fabric that's going to be provided by Fourth Estate Network Optimization, uh, one nipper, one sipper, one campus environment uh, for the Fourth Estate, raising the bar for security and usability. Next slide. I mentioned the Transport Services Directorate, um, foundational to the capabilities that we deliver at DISA. Ultimately, we want it to be uh, ubiquitous and commoditized and quite frankly, not even thought of. We want to use all mediums to be able to deliver the data where it needs to go, when it needs to be there. That's uh, Chris Padzikowski's job jar. He has um, uh, the gateways. So if you think about how do we bring uh, the space layer into the, into the DISM, he has that piece of it to include the teleports, uh, senior uh, national leadership comms. How do we communicate with the other senior leaders in other countries so that we are collaborating and sharing information that we need to, again, to make those decisions with our partners at the speed of relevance. Uh, there's a, a, a very large engineering component of this, and we'll talk about this in the service offerings. You know, how do we evolve this uh, large, complex uh, capability uh, and continue to improve every time uh, we deliver capability? And then obviously there's an implementation and installation globally that has to be done, and we're heavily relying on industry to make that happen. Next slide. I did mention the Cyberspace Operations Director under Joe Wassel. Uh, the Commander of Commanders is at the DISA Joint Operations Center, and we recently signed our C2 CONOPS where 
uh, that really is the nexus of how we drive uh, not only change management, incident management, uh, but overall operations across a global enterprise. Also within the Cyberspace Operations Directorate is Global Public Safety Communications. Uh, we'll talk about one of the offerings that we have in that area in a, in a, in a minute. But if you think about uh, next generation 911, going beyond just a phone call to location, potential video, integration of uh, uh, different capabilities that are provided on the spot by first responders, that's all in global public safety comms. Uh, one of our commanders, DISA Global, really is the heartbeat of how we drive transport uh, to include uh, service out uh, outages, uh, defense. Um, they're in the middle of all of it. We also have a contingent right in the Pentagon, hand in glove with uh, JSP, to make sure that the Joint Staff is supported, that the National Mil Military Command System is supported. That's the JSSC. Uh, we also provide uh, cyber, secu cyber security service provider services uh, currently with a multitude of customers and we're evolving that capability into uh, higher classified realms. You've heard us talk about um, supply chain risk management, how are we making sure that the capabilities that you deliver have the pedigree that we need so that we're able to protect our enterprise the way that we need to. That happens in uh, Joe Wassel's directorate as well, we, where we do uh, mission assurance and um, illumination on capabilities to make sure that what, what's being delivered is actually what we need. We obviously have a headquarters operational contingent, and then I mentioned the, the field commands where we're hand in glove with every commander. We want to make sure we're close with their J6s, with their J3s, to understand what the requirements gaps are and what do we need to deliver. Next slide. So just a little bit about the acquisition opportunities, and uh, I've been vain up to this point. I'm going to put my glasses on now because I can't see. Um, so public safety comms. I mentioned next generation 911. Um, so this requirement here is uh, to provide DOD public safety communications capability and information technology to support public safety missions. It, what we're looking for is a prototype to demonstrate interoperability between land mobile radios, 5G LTE, cell phones, and HF radios. If you can imagine having all these disparate ways to communicate and the only way that you can cross collaborate is literally a, a, a speaker to microphone manual uh, trans, uh, uh, kind of transaction. We're looking for a, a prototype to bring that together. We're, we're going to use an OTA uh, to streamline the development process and to um, bring on some emerging technology. Um, so the Office of Global Public Safety Comms is uh, also responsible for the architecture for land mobile radios and bringing all that together. And so what we're looking for, again, true interoperability between LMR devices, no matter the manufacturer, first of all. You know, sometimes you can deliver a standard and there's still gaps between the different uh, offerings and there is uh, integration required. So they're looking uh, to solve that as well as, again, that baseband interoperability among LMR, uh, cell phones, and HF radios. So that's the public safety comms uh, next gen 911 offering. Uh, the, the second one that you see there is uh, we call it IMS, uh, IMS ITSS. It's, uh, so it's a contract that's going to provide us the IT, the classified IT support services vital to, joint, to the joint staff support center's ability to perform its mission to conduct command and control and communications operations for the chairman and for the uh, NMCS, the National Military Command System. So this includes cybersecurity, things like database, administrator, database administrators, system administrators, network administrators, um, and it's, to, it's really to provide those critical internal systems and to include things like GCCSJ, um, NCCS, JOPS, um, as far as uh, the operation and maintenance, it's also a critical piece of a, our ability to operate and maintain those systems, not only at the Pentagon, but also at uh, the JSSC's continuity of operations site. There's a small piece of it as well that is the visual, visual secure um, information and telev television production support to the Office of the Secretary of Defense, to the Chairman, to the Joint Staff, and the NMCC. 
So this task also includes uh, trend analysis, problem management, gap analysis of fielded systems, identification of key, key terrain, um, as well as maintaining the day-to-day -day configuration management and oversight of the NMCC and its um, coop sites. So a significant driver for uh, how we deliver capability at the Pentagon, maintain that capability and support it with personnel. Can you go to the next slide, please? So a couple of other offerings. Um, so DISM PMO engineering, uh, systems engineering technical support. You can see there it provides for IT consulting and analytical services, uh, application, tool development, planning, technical and programmatic support for the transport services directorate. So what we're looking for here is a vendor to provide enterprise resource planning and business anal analysis to include things like uh, portals for knowledge management, uh, financial tracking system to help us um, make sure that we're uh, on top of our game with regard to uh, delivery of capability uh, in the finance world. The vendor will also uh, provide technical support as it pertains to the evolution of the DISN. So again, I mentioned the DISN technical evolution plan. This contract is critical to uh, that, uh, delivering that not only to, to DISA, but to DOD CIO. Um, the vendor will be assisting and also uh, developing and implementing standard methodologies and automated processes for these management systems and will require support services in DISN communications, uh, messaging, information sharing, scheduling, and task management activities. Um, I just want to point out with this particular contract that the vendor will be working very closely with the government in the development requirements uh, for acquisition for broader transport. And so there, there, may, there may be a probability of um, uh, rendering in, ineligible for some competitions for larger transport offerings. So that is the DISN PMO system engineering and technical support contract. Um, as far as the financial management support services, um, this is also an IE6. It's uh, tied closely to the, to the previous contract I mentioned. And again, it's to provide expertise and documentation to report on um, funding, execution, budgeting, cost estimation, um, you know, multi-billion dollar effort that needs to be shepherded. These two contracts help us uh, make it through the wickets. The last thing is the cybersecurity technical administrative support services. Um, you know, again, we're looking for cybersecurity information support to ensure the systems that are meeting the set DOD cybersecurity requirements and standards. Um, the vendor will be responsible for the protection and sustainment of the information and insurance requirements for the system and for information availability. So if you think things like um, ACAS, HBSS support, um, IAVA support, uh, patching and remediation, uh, that's what this contract is about. Uh, the vendor will also help us maintain uh, ComSec key and crypto deployments and tracking those things as well as associated crypto nets. And I think lastly, uh, the vendor will be providing technical and engineering expertise as it pertains to InfoSec levels and requirements. And so that's a quick rundown of um, not only what we're doing in the center and the different facets of the center, but some of the offerings that are going to help us uh, not only drive innovation, but also keep the train moving on time with regard to financial management, security, and, um, and patching. So that's a broad brush, and I guess we have a moment for any questions. Mr. Means, no questions for you at this time. Man, you guys are easy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Means. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next speaker, Ms. Sharon Woods, Director, Hosting and Compute Center. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is going to be a two-part conversation. So first, I'm going to speak about uh, the HACS broader opportunities, and then I'm going to ask Paul Crumbliss. He is the office chief for the compute operations, and he's going to speak about our specific contracting opportunities. 
so you see on the slides some of the different efforts that are listed. And what I wanted to do was frame for industry and small business how you can help us and partner with us going forward. So JWCC, contract aside, all of the mission partners and customers that are looking to get into that contract are in very different stages of maturity on moving into the cloud. The role of the system integrator is really important, and I don't just mean large businesses. I really mean any company that can support a mission partner in framing their application, uh, migrating the application into the environment so that they are really ready to operate. We're taking a decentralized approach, meaning that rather than having a single integrator contract, mission partners need to be able to reach out to many companies in order to support them in that journey. And so I think it is really important and incumbent on industry to connect with different mission partners and customers to understand where they are in their journey and help them get into the contract environment. I encourage you to reach out to us because of course we have information about which customers are ready to move or thinking about moving and we can uh, help just industry understand who those mission partners are. But again, please connect with the mission partners themselves. Uh, I think the systems integrators and contractors that can support mission partners are gonna play a really, really key role in making that contract successful. The other efforts I wanted to talk about, again, some of them are listed here. So for instance, uh, infrastructure as code, uh, we partnered uh, with a company to, uh, um, we actually did, so OTAs are spoken about quite a bit. One of the other contract vehicles I wanted to bring to your attention are called CRADAs, Collaborative Research and Development Agreements. You often see them in labs, uh, but there's nothing that precludes any office or agency from using those. Oftentimes there are zero dollar agreements um, sometimes they can be at cost, but what they tend to be is a collaborative effort between the government and that partner to develop something together. And then oftentimes there are opportunities, financial opportunities following, but infrastructure as code is a really great example where we have three and we're in the process of having four different CRADA agreements with the cloud vendors. And we developed uh, infrastructure code pre-accredited pre-configured baselines that help create cloud environments in two to four hours rather than weeks or months that's a really critical capability so that mission partners can get into the cloud quickly uh, that is just an example of where something like a crata is a great opportunity to partner with industry or small business on what are those other type accelerators or things that will help mission partners use cloud in a way that is smart, in a way that gets them in there more quickly. And we were having a conversation earlier with uh, the media roundtable, and I wanted to share it with you all is that, you know, what, what would we share with small business to help them understand how to partner with us? And I think one of the most critical things is help us understand the area where you are really specialized, because we are focused on doing efforts in six months or less to get to a minimum viable product. That's something that the hack has done now repeatedly. And so the more we understand your business area and that you're able to articulate, this is what I can deliver, and this is how I can deliver it in six months, and this is ultimately how it scales. We've proven that that model works, and so I, I think it would be good for you to connect with us. You can go to hack.mil. There is a contact page uh, so that we can talk through some of the different opportunities. The other area uh, that's not explicitly mentioned here, uh, but I do want to mention it, is Oconus Cloud. So what do we mean by that? Uh, JWCC, because of data sovereignty rules, the data centers that we use from the commercial cloud providers have to be on US soil. So they are in the United States. But the warfighter operates across the world. And there are needs, whether it's because they become isolated geographically, uh, because communications go down, even when you look at something like Hawaii, at any given time, they could become isolated from a communication standpoint, which means they can't reach back to the cloud environment that's in the United States. 
So what do they do? And so Oconus Cloud, one of the areas we're looking at is with Stratus, our private cloud environment, is can we deploy that? Should we deploy that overseas in our data centers that are in Germany, that are in Japan, that are in Hawaii? Uh, but how do those capabilities work with commercial cloud? How does hybrid work with private cloud and commercial cloud? So I'll give you an example where uh, data replication or failover capabilities become really important. So for instance, the application may be in the main cloud environment, but that there is continuous data replication to Stratus in the private cloud environment. So if communications are disconnected, the application has the latest copy of the data and is able to continue to operate, essentially creating local cloud regions across the world. And that is also inclusive of tactical edge capabilities, where if an environment, um, whether the warfighter is in an environment that is deprived of good communications or a particular region, I mean, even Germany, when you think about current conflicts, could become isolated from a communication standpoint. How do you continue to have the application with that data run at the point of collection? And sometimes that means using tactical edge capabilities where it's smaller form factors that still provide hosting and compute, um, maybe not as much as what you would get with a broader commercial cloud, uh, the main environment. Uh, but if you think about something like tactical assault uh, kits, where you have to be able to track troop movement locally, uh, it's critical capability. Uh, those folks are not in a place where communications are dependable, and so you need to be able to have tactical edge devices that those applications can hang off of. But then back at headquarters, they also need to understand where troops are moving and where they're going, and so when they are connected, that data can then flow. But if they become disconnected locally, you're still able to operate warfighter movements. And so I, I try and throw out, I know this is a bit of a, um, a scattershot of different things, and what I'm trying to convey to you is that there isn't a one-size-fits-all for these different kinds of capabilities and needs. We are looking at hybrid cloud, we're looking at Oconus cloud, we're trying to understand cloud accelerators, and all of these are opportunities, whether it's through subcontracting with our existing contractors, using something like a CRADA, um, even new contracting efforts, if that's what makes sense. Uh, but I think all of these present opportunities at a broad brush level um, for us to partner with you. And so whether it's through the website, whether it is at our table today or connecting with me directly, we really encourage you to connect with us. Um, and, and there is a hack action plan that nests underneath the DISA strategic plan. I encourage you to read that because it really shows what we're thinking about. And so as you frame your discussion with us, it gives you a really good point of reference. So with that, I'm going to ask Paul Crumbliss to come up and talk about our specific contracting activities. Good afternoon. I'm Paul Crumbliss, Chief of Compute Ops. Uh, so just a quick overview here so that everyone understands. Quite a few years ago, DISA got out of the business in the compute ops world um, of buying equipment, procuring the equipment, and putting it out on the floor. What they did is they transitioned into a business model where we actually would get the capability from the vendors, and that way we could quickly and efficiently get the capability onto the floor without actually having to procure the equipment so that we could then plus up the equipment or remove the equipment from the environment quickly, and that was a cost savings for both the government and the mission partners. And so um, the first contracts that we're going to go over uh, these are follow-on to those what we call capacity services contract that uh, provides that capability. And so the vendors are actually the ones that are um, on the equipment and put it out there. And we leverage that to provide that capability to our mission partners. So the first one is our eight, x86 processing um, processor contract. Uh, this is going to be a follow-on. It's in uh, 25 is when it we have expected to be awarded, and it'll be a five-year contract with five one-year um, follow-on years on that. Uh, it's about in the 300 plus million dollar range, 
and this is kind of the one of the core contracts for the capabilities that we have on the data center so this is all the x86 workload that sits within the DISA data centers will come off of this contract uh, the next one is the spark compatible um, contract so like the x86 is for the spark this is also in about the 300 million dollar range and um, again this is the capability uh, for all the spark technology that we put out in the data center they um, will provide that capability so that we can support the mission partners uh, then we've got the um, integrated spark contract uh, that one is only about in the hundred million dollar range um, and again it's also in 25 so it's a smaller one but it also will provide that core infrastructure of the processing capability that we put out onto the data center floor uh, the last capacity service contract that we have coming up is actually our um, uh, communications capacity services contract. This is all the communications infrastructure that sits inside the data centers and all the locations we have worldwide. And so this contract is about a $900 million contract, and it also will be a five-year with five one-year follow-ons in the 25. This one is um, going to take care of all of the glass, all the equipment inside the glass house. That's all the routers, switches, and everything that's inside from the data center back that supports all the mission partner workload inside the data center. Not to be confused with the actual WAN and the Doden that's taken care of by IE. Mr. Penkowski, uh, who briefed earlier, um, he takes care of that. Um, but of course, we do a equally fantastic job inside the data center. So, uh, so that's that contract. So those are our capacity services contracts. Again, these are really the core of how we do business inside the data centers. They provide the capability that for all the mission partner workload that we take care of inside the data centers. Uh, the next contract, this is a Broadcom um, uh, software contract. It is a follow-on contract. This supports our IBM uh, mainframe environment that we host inside the data centers, and this is really a software acquisition. Uh, then we um, have what we call our sustainment support for infrastructure. And what this is, is this is a um, personnel. Uh, we get FTEs that support our um, database and uh, administrators that support uh, all the workload that we have on the floor. So this is a um, uh, east and west, we call it. That's just geographically how we support it. It's a, a contracts that we have that support um, both the East Coast and West Coast, the data centers, and the workload that we have there. But they do the same, they um, accomplish the same tasking. And this takes care of um, all the uh, eight by five and 24 by seven support that we do inside the data centers um, for the mission partners. Uh, then we have a cabling, insulation and cabling. This takes care of all the cabling effort to uh, install for tech refreshes, uh, implementation, and uh, removal of equipment. This takes care of all the cabling inside the data centers um, uh, around the world. Um, then we've got a uh, mainframe line of business. This is um, uh, basically, this supports all the OS storage, uh, database, all the operations for the mainframe workload that we have inside the data centers. And then uh, we have an infrastructure support. And uh, what this does is this takes care of um, all the backup, virtualization, storage um, for all of the workload that sits inside the data centers. And then the final one, this is a smaller contract, but it's for our CAD and engineering services. And this is uh, for the data centers. It takes care of all the designs, the floor layout, and all the spaces at all of our locations. So we're happy to take questions. Um. Yes, ma'am. Can you please restate what CRETA stands for? CRETA, CRETA, CRETA. Sure, CRETA, CRETA uh, Collaborative Research and Development Agreement. Thank you. That was your last question. All right.
ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions for our speakers, be sure to send them to askdissa, F2I, at mail.mil. That's askdissa, F2I, at mail.mil. Now please welcome Mr. Jason Martin, Director, Digital Capabilities and Security Center. All right, good afternoon. I had a one o'clock speaking engagement last week and I kept everybody awake. I'm up here like 10 minutes, so you should be good. All right. So I'm not gonna steal the thunder of my, my team here, but I did wanna show you DCSC's basically the same as it was last year, but we're certainly doing new and exciting things. So just a different view, but if you just look from, from left to right, really the glue, which I'm gonna talk about from a contract uh, opportunity perspective, is that mission partner engagement office that brings all this together and they really span my organization but they also span the entire agency they're responsible for building those relationships across the department and then across the agency and doing that two-way strategic communication so those are the opportunities i'll talk about in just a minute but importantly more importantly so i've got you know just to break down the organization here and the capabilities they provide um, Martha Jasper's here today to talk about the top, which is basically Enterprise Services, Collaboration C2, which we've got some exciting things going on in that space. Obviously, Dr. Herman is here to talk about cyber and all the, the wonderful things they're doing and certainly the department and DISA-wide impactful items like, like Thunderdome. And then the Spectrum organization, Kevin Laughlin here, I believe, is to talk um, about what they're doing with EMBM and a few other things, electromagnetic federal management. And then JIDIC is kind of the foundation for testing across the department, which I talked about a little bit earlier um, in terms of them providing assessments for SPAs and doing everything they're doing. Captain uh, Matthias has done a great job of building that community and a coalition ac across the globe. But if you were here this morning, you heard me talk a little bit about what we're doing from a program management development perspective. It's all about partnership. And so really, I spend a lot of my time not doing these capabilities, right? I just laid out all the, the very capable folks we have in those organizations, but really trying to provide that cross-agency look, the developmental perspective, workforce development from an acquisition perspective to make sure people are being trained the way they need to, certainly to engage with you all in industry to make sure we're delivering capabilities. So that is um, really, I would say, the majority of, of where I spend my time and certainly I get to learn about and work with all these folks as well. So from an overall strategic vision perspective, that's exactly what we're trying to do. You know, the boss said it a few times this morning is partner. We're trying to partner within our own teams, with industry and with our mission partners to ensure that we are delivering across the board. So as I get into my opportunities, you'll hear that same, that same kind of thing. So I've got two at the, at, the center, at the center level and they're really one. So those of you who are or are not familiar with mission partner engagement, really what that is is the portfolio management, customer portfolio management group for the agency. It does fall in DCSE, but it represents every single center in the organization. So um, the two opportunities here, which I won't read all the specifics, but what's important to know is this organization is in the process of transforming into really the go-to across the board and ensuring that two-way communication with, with the customer base. So what we really need here are your best and brightest, as I mentioned earlier today, folks that can interpret the capabilities that we are providing and need to provide and build those strategic partnerships and relationships with the customer base. So a number of you are also supporting, not just DISA, right? Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, pick your favorite DAFA. That's what these folks do. I can't go to every mission partner meeting. Right? nor can anybody else in the agency, but that is exactly what their job is. So when you think about bidding on items like this, make sure that you're prepared to bring your best and brightest that's able to communicate, develop solutions, and really work at an SES, GO, GS-15 level. It's very important. Um, you may see the, the labor categories, but my expectation for mission partner engagement is that anybody and everybody can talk at the four-star level down to the GS-1 level and across the board. So just so you know, that's exactly what I'm looking for. That organization's absolutely near and dear to my heart. When I first moved to DC, I was one of the leaders in that group. They are critical to ensuring DISA and department success. The second item on here is the requirements analysis office, which really used to bring, or still does, but they were responsible for identifying capability gaps in the agency, whether it was through the IPL process with the COCOMs or 
you know, a DAFA would say, hey, have you thought about this? Or a COCOM would say, have you thought about that? Or we could, we should enhance its capability this way. Their, their job is to really look at the requirements that are coming into the agency, work with the program managers, work with Mr. Barnhurst, work with myself, work with, you know, the center chiefs to say, yeah, we think we should do this because, or no, we shouldn't because. So it's very much an analytical type position in terms of what are the requirements today? What do they need to be tomorrow? Are we shaping them? Is this something we should do and shouldn't do? So again, customer facing, right? So your company will be represented. Yeah, these are DISA contracts, but they work with the entire department. So when you think about, again, bidding on this work, this is very near and dear to my heart, number one, but number two, this is the face of the agency. And that is the expectation is that you're bringing the right folks to be the face, face of the agency. So I've got the, the details on there. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to ask for questions or not, but just so you know, this is, you know, you heard from me this morning, you're hearing from me now, same thing, right? Partnership, collaboration, best foot forward. Okay. I'm gonna assume no questions, right, Jim? Sir, uh, stand by, I think we do have a question for you. Oh, okay. You're not getting out of here that easily. Okay. And here we go. Oh, you are. I thought it's all Kevin, not you. What is the estimated dollar value for CSCII? Also, the slide deck said RFP uh, third quarter FY25. Should that have said uh, FY24 with an award in quarter two FY25? Is it really 25? Okay, it is correct. 25 is correct, and I am not going to provide dollar values up here. I think that would probably get me in a lot of trouble. Thank you, Mr. Martin. That's the only question we have for you. All right. Enjoy the rest of the presentation. Thanks, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, please welcome Dr. Brian Herman, Director, Cybersecurity and Analytics Directorate. Hey, good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> appreciate the, uh, the chance to talk to you. I didn't want to give you a wiring diagram, but I thought it was helpful. <clears throat> so we're organized right now the way we've been organized for a while. Uh, we have a security enablers team. That group does uh, some key, key capabilities in that group that are, include PKI, uh, as well as uh, identity uh, credentialing and access management. We have another group that does endpoint security. Um, they, they do the, uh, the security tools that are on just about every desktop across the, uh, uh, across the department. Uh, a couple of them that are, that are real crucial, enterprise uh, security solution as well as comply to connect. Uh, we can talk about some others in there as well. We also run the JRSS program across the department, which is a mid-tier cybersecurity capability where the, uh, the DISN backbone connects to the other networks that the services provide. Uh, and then finally we have, well not finally, we have perimeter uh, security, sort of from our, our geographical approach of this, the perimeter is, is, the, uh, is the front and back door uh, out to, like when we're talking about our unclassified or non-classified networks, uh, the, uh, the connections through the internet access points, uh, it, it includes cross domain capabilities that we provide as well. Uh, and then finally we have the cybersecurity, uh, our cy cybersecurity uh, analytics, uh, and data sharing. So the director mentioned this morning that we have a tremendous amount of data that comes from all these tools. And what do we do with it? So we have to do defensive cyber operations. And we have to do uh, CSSP functions for the department as well. Uh, one thing that I would tell you in that space is, is we, we are drowning in data um, and we need to automate the response because the, the, the prospect of hiring enough people to, to do that is, is daunting. And in, in all likelihood, we would never be able to respond fast enough uh, in, uh, in that scenario either. And then on top of this, I have zero trust transformation. Uh, and I, <clears throat> we call our pilot program uh, Thunderdome. And so that program is underway right now. Uh, Thunderdome really ties all those elements together because, uh, and I'll give a, a kind of a scenario. Uh, for, for this to work, we have to be able to say, who is the, is the individual that's trying to access a capability or data? How do, they, how do we know that that's them? So we use PKI, 
who use ICAM, Identity Credentialing and Access Management, to say, I can verify that's Brian, and, uh, and then through ICAM we can say he does have access to this, but wait a second, I'm not sure about him because his device has not been patched, it's not a DOD capa uh, patched capability, it, it's uh, maybe not coming from a trusted network or a trusted location as well. And so that's the kind of thing that we're going to eventually get to, and it really is going to be something that has to be done across the department, make those fine grain access control decisions. And as a good example, we actually do that in O365 right now. When you, when you log in from a personal computer with a CAC card, you actually can access your email. You can see it through the, just only through the web, not through an application. You can't download things, you can't print things. And that's the kind of fine grain access control we want to make in a zero trust uh, uh, future. So, so really a lot of things going on. Uh, I've heard some others say <clears throat> that in a zero trust future, uh, maybe we don't need that perimeter. And I would argue that, uh, that, that you still do need a perimeter. You probably, even if you feel safe inside your house, you lock the front door. Um, and so why wouldn't you just uh, make sure that some of those those threats uh, don't aren't aren't able to propagate through the uh, through the network either, and so really that zero trust mindset potentially could change what our organization looks like, uh, but it does have wide ranging effects, and it affects other parts of the agency uh, as well. We are uh, we are partnering with our uh, uh, DoD Net team for the Defense Enclave Services. So as we roll out capabilities to to be the, the enclave provider for other fourth estate organizations. We're rolling that out with Thunderdome and Zero Trust in place. We're doing the same things with our JSP partners down at the Pentagon. And so, so we have to think about it from an enclave perspective, but we also have to think about it from the backbone perspective. And so, so that, is, uh, that is kind of my vision of where the future is. Uh, the challenge for us, as I, as I you know, kind of put the, put the challenge in front of my portfolio managers in each of those areas, is to be the thought leader in your space. Uh, just because we've done something for X number of years doesn't mean that's still the same thing we should be doing. The threat has changed, the technology has changed. And so as industry partners, what we need to understand from you is, is where are the things that we're doing no longer relevant, no longer you know, uh, maybe efficient ways uh, to solve those, those problems. Uh, and, and that's really, you'll see, we'll, we'll talk about some opportunities coming up here, but, but I think it's important to, to say we don't necessarily all have the thought leaders in those areas now, but the challenge for them is to come out and engage with you, understand the, the changing threats, uh, and, and help chart a course for our future. Can we go to the next slide? So in the, in the security enablers group, we are modernizing DOD PKI. Um, it's easy to say, it's really hard to do. So we work with our NSA partners and we're trying to overcome what I would call legacy mindsets in terms of controls. Uh, this is a, a, a key area and, and the way we've approached it historically has been to have physical separation of this equipment and physical separation of the individuals that had responsibilities on that equipment. And that just doesn't work in, a, in, in this, in this pace, uh, the fast paced environment that we're in. It doesn't work in a cloud environment. And so we can't be efficient. It really costs too much money to deliver PKI. And so we're partnering with NSA to try to see how we update that rule set so that we can actually achieve what we're trying to do with, with PKI. And I already mentioned how that's sort of fundamental uh, for zero trust. Um, we've put in place some, uh, some insider threat capabilities as well. Uh, you, you'll, see, you'll see things in here that kind of fit alongside that scenario where we're, we're trying to evaluate the, uh, the status of an endpoint uh, in, with things like automated patch management and things. Uh, but, uh, but ICAM is, the, uh, is kind of that shining star in this space. It doesn't happen without PKI. And, uh, and, and we, we have a capability out there. We have, as the director mentioned, we have in excess of 150 applications that are currently using the Global Federated User Directory, our identity provider for PKI right now. Uh, and we have a back end that is automating, you know, the DOD folks will like this, we're automating the 2875, it's, a, it's called automated account provisioning, so forget the paper that we've had historically, and that feeds a master user record that has a list of everything that Brian should have access to. And so if something happens to me, if I try to access something, you can say, what, what does he have access to, and, and maybe we need to change that. Uh, and so, 
So this is a key set of things that need to happen in the uh, security enablers uh, division. Next slide. So I expect uh, we'll have a little test on this uh, after. Um, <clears throat> no, actually, they, they actually dropped the heading on it. But, uh, but what I want you to take away from this picture is, is um, this is essentially the high level architectural view of, of uh, PKI. Uh, how, how it works on the unclassified as well as classified networks. We have a cross-domain solution in the middle there, uh, and we have things that have to handle uh, both people and non-person entities uh, because we want to understand whether a device should be trusted uh, in this scenario as well. So this is, this is the complexity. When I say DOD uh, uh, PKI modernization, uh, it's really easy to say this is why it's hard. I would also say that in, in a couple of areas that we work, that the tools or the skills that are required to do this work are exquisite. Uh, PKI is one of them, cross domain is another one. Uh, so if, if you and your team have those skills, I wanna talk to you. Um, that's, what, that's what gets me excited. If we can go directly to the folks that have those skills, uh, we can make some real progress. Next slide. Uh, endpoint, uh, we talked a little bit about it as well, but we have uh, endpoint capabilities uh, that are out there, comply to connect. <clears throat> it's been a little disappointing from a, an adoption perspective for the department um, that the, uh, we're using the tools, but it's not reporting back the status of, of uh, everybody's device uh, to let us know whether or not they are compliant. But ultimately our goal is to, is to, is to deny access to DOD networks, to do, deny access to, uh, to applications if your device is not something that we can trust. Uh, and, and so uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna be making a little bit of a chain course correction in terms of, of, of how we license that capability. Uh, but it is in fact, uh, uh, I think uh, at the early stages of a success story uh, in that space as well. Um, insider threat has got a little bit of uh, changing uh, landscape. Uh, we do it for, for DISA and for some of our, our terrain uh, supported customers. Uh, it's, uh, it, we think it, the, the best way to handle that, we have a good capability that's in place, but it's important for the folks that are doing the, uh, the uh, insider threat uh, analysis to understand the mission of an organization. If you're too far removed from the mission, you, uh, you in all likelihood would have, uh, would have trouble understanding whether or not something's a threat. So, next slide, please. So, um, <clears throat> If, if you have uh, been following Zero Trust at all, uh, you've probably seen the, uh, the DOD's uh, Zero Trust, uh, back one, the Zero Trust reference architecture. Left one, one again. Let's see if we can do it. Okay, so, so we have a Zero Trust reference architecture that the, uh, that the department has published. We also have a maturity model associated with that, and there's no, no less than 152 elements that we think need to be addressed in order to achieve a, uh, a satisfactory level of zero trust. And, and that, that really aggressive timeline to do that is between now and 2027. Um, so uh, that's, a, uh, that's gonna be a daunting task for application owners, uh, for data owners as well. Uh, but uh, we also have uh, in that space, we've historically been defending against uh, the, the number one uh, threat vector for for uh, cyber has been through email, uh, and uh, and we've used uh, the EEMSG program uh, that that does that. We're trying to move that capability into the cloud where email is now, uh, and uh, and make sure that it that it meets the needs as we go forward as well. Uh, cross domain is as I mentioned before another one of those exquisite areas where we need help. If if you have that kind of experience, uh, we're also looking at how that changes as the, uh, the JWCC contract requires cloud vendors to have cross-domain capabilities within their own uh, infrastructure as well. Next slide. Okay, now we'll go into the, uh, to the ones that I, I won't dive into each one of these things. I'll kind of uh, pick and choose a little bit. Uh, the DNS hardening, uh, and, and uh, we, have, we have a responsibility there for the entire department, uh, and that's a follow-on contract I don't think is, is, is too, uh, uh, too complex, but I think it's something that's important as we look at at what is going on in the department, uh, how we defend against the uh, the evolving threat in that space. Uh, I mentioned cross domain again. I, I think that that just can't be 
can't be overemphasized how how challenging that space is uh, to make sure. And if you think about it, that's an element of the perimeter. Uh, when whether you're uh, being able to go from the unclassified networks to the classified networks or the reverse, how do we make sure that we're not allowing threats to progress or classified information to move uh, inappropriately from one domain to the other? Next slide. Um, so we also have a, a cyber development um, professional services and portfolio management contract, and that's a big kind of umbrella that allows us to have program support folks in each of the uh, the divisions within the cyber development uh, uh, cyber security and analytics uh, directorate um, that's a place where i think we can use uh, help not just people that understand how to how to do program support but also people that understand the uh, the mission space that we're working um, probably uh, many of you are familiar with the uh, the acas uh, uh, compliance assessment so that's a scanning capability that we have to make sure that workstations are in compliance as well. Next slide. Um, I think that's a duplicate on the DNS hardening. Uh, gateways uh, also, like like uh, cross domain and other elements of the perimeter, gateways are an area where we uh, uh, where we have to make sure that we protect and, and defend the network. Uh, if you, I, I guess, if you want a a, a, a good kind of uh, scenario, uh, we know that in in light of uh, recent events in Ukraine. That there's uh, there's additional uh, you know effort to try to look at whether we have vulnerabilities. Uh, we've been obviously we've been in the thick of this for a long time, uh, but we know that that's that's something that uh, that any state actor is going to come and take a look at. So so with all of the things going on, you would expect to see that as well. Uh, the last one on this slide I think is interesting: cloud-based uh, internet isolation. Um, that basically is to to virtualize the browser. When you go out uh, from a DOD workstation and, and go on an internet site, uh, you're actually just kind of seeing a picture of that capability. Uh, and, and, and that's a, a, a fantastic capability that we think is going to allow us to, to sunset some other capabilities, uh, potentially, or, or resize them uh, because the threat is somewhat diminished. Uh, CBII is a success story. Uh, we have uh, we reached. 2.4 million users on that capability this uh, past fiscal year. This year, our target is, is 3 million. Uh, and then next year, we should complete the DOD-wide implementation at, uh, at uh, approximately 3.5 million. Next slide. Sharks here, uh, this is a, another place where, where we you know, obviously need some, uh, some really uh, skilled assessment. So this is the, uh, the security software that we use at the internet access points to, to, to do, you know, to identify vulnerabilities and to do auto, automated mitigations. Uh, and we're interested in commercial alternatives to the capabilities that are out there as well. Uh, there's some promising stuff in that space that we're, uh, we're hoping is, is going to be helpful. But uh, again, you know, as we, as we look at that as a, an element of our, of our boundary, uh, that's something that probably needs to be modernized. And we're uh, really still just in the final stages of moving that capability from NSA to DISA. Next slide. Um, defense industrial base network. So uh, this is actually a capability that allows us to, uh, or allows our, our uh, defense industrial base partners to identify vulnerabilities that they, they may have found uh, and share that with other DIB partners uh, for the DOD, as well as across the federal uh, space. Uh, this is, a, uh, I think, a good capability that probably could use uh, some amount of modernization as we go forward. And I think that's the last slide I had, but uh, uh, hopefully I gave you some, some stuff to think about. If you have uh, questions, I'll take a few of those here uh, before I turn it over. Yep. Sir, given the current status of Thunderdome and recent extension of the prototype, what is the current planned life cycle of JRSS? Okay, so just to be clear, JRSS uh, and Thunderdome are not, not anywhere near equivalent. So JRSS will be sunset by the end of 2027. Uh, we, have a, uh, we have a target for that. Uh, uh, and, and we will be making, for Thunderdome, we'll be making a production decision that'll put us on a path to start deploying that capability, um, you know, hopefully soon after a January decision. Um, it's a, it's a, 
a, a pretty challenging effort to do all of the sites. I think we have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.8 million users and, and somewhere close to 350 sites that are supported by JRSS today. Uh, and, and so you can't just pull the plug. How do we do that in a, in a manner that, that uh, reflects all of the capabilities that are in JRSS, which ones we think persist from a cybersecurity perspective, and potentially which ones uh, you know, uh, get replaced by things like Thunderdome. Uh, there's, there's routing capabilities in there as well. So I think, I think when you really look at like Zero Trust as an example, I think that's the, the kind of the embodiment of, of LOE4 for the agency, uh, kind of looking at the, uh, the user experience as well as uh, the cybersecurity status. Uh, and, and we've seen some tremendous benefits already in Thunderdome. So, so we're doing operational assessment. Uh, we will complete that and make that production decision in January. Uh, but one example of, uh, we've replaced the, uh, the VPN capabilities that are part of JRSS with a uh, secure access service edge or SASE capability. Uh, <clears throat> and that also streamlines our routing. So we no, no longer do we go into a JRSS node, hairpin back out and go out to cloud-based services. We go directly from where the user is to those cloud-based services. Even if you're at home teleworking, uh, that's, a, that's a big difference. And so I've had people tell me that their user experience is better from home when they're on uh, Thunderdome and that capability than, than if they're in the office. Um, that, you know, so we think we got, we got both good things to do for, from a user experience perspective. And our evaluation right now that's going on also is going to evaluate current capabilities against the new capabilities from a cybersecurity perspective. Is it as good or better? And what do we achieve? Can we limit the ability to move laterally through the network? So um, I, I hesitate to make, to, to make a direct comparison of JRSS to, to Thunderdome because I think it's you know, 10 years later and we would do it very differently. Uh, but, but we know that we have a lot of customers that have to move off by 2027. Dr. Herman, can you elaborate on your efforts related to insider threat? So we, we have a capability in place, uh, both licensing of, a, of commercial capability, as well as we, uh, we provide the ability to roll that information up. Um, so, so kind of two levels of functions. Uh, and then we also have a contract vehicle in place that allows us to get um, uh, full-time equivalents or you know, FTEs, uh, subject matter experts to do that work uh, for organizations. So DISA does that uh, for us in our terrain. JSP does it uh, for their terrain as well. There's been some discussion inside the department about whether some of that gets centralized. I, I think I, I stated my position earlier that I think that, that the analysts, analysts are better if they're closer to the mission uh, than if they're farther away. Please discuss your interaction with the CDO office, especially in the area of analytics and big data. Yeah, um, so, so we, uh, I said we're drowning in data, we absolutely are. Um, and uh, and uh, Caroline Kaharski and, that, and the CDO team is trying to help us with that. Um, and we're also uh, taking a, a critical look at what data we're collecting, uh, how much of it, for how long, and, uh, and one observation I, I had, I think, in our, in our first level of analysis was that somewhere near uh, between 35 and 40 percent of the data that we have is actually actionable. Uh, the rest is stored because it was available. Uh, and that doesn't make much sense. It really confuses the analyst uh, because they're just looking at, at information that's really never going to probably help them. Uh, and so. Uh, we are moving. Uh, we are moving our current capabilities to uh, commercial cloud. Uh, we will have the unclassified capabilities in place uh, by the end of this month. We will have the classified capabilities in place by the end of March, uh, and and so that's going to allow us to be able to make the next step, the next trans, uh, transformation, which is to say, how do we take you know make sure that we're only capturing that actionable data, and how do we how do we actually automate the response actions. That's where I, I, another place where I could definitely use some help. Uh, I see it, you know, when I walk the floors at industry uh, 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 events, uh, there are capabilities that can get us 75, 80 uh, percent automation of, of this. And, and right now, the analysts are, are ha having a rough day 
when I when I look at at their day and and how our tools contribute to making that day harder, uh, I I know that we have to do better in that space. And so Caroline and the team are helping us uh, establish uh, what data to collect, but also how much of that data is used for multiple purposes. Uh, we use it for defensive cyber operations. We use it for CSSP. We use it for net ops. Uh, in, in many cases, it's the same data. So how do we make sure that we do that? We get a little bit less tool uh, tool centric and more tool agnostic uh, as we uh, as we do that. So we we've got we pay a lot of money for infrastructure. We pay a lot of money for um, for tools, and and we're not getting as much as we should out of it. Final question. What is your perspective on the role of data loss prevention technology in this is zero trust strategy? Yeah, so um, it's absolutely a, a, a singular piece of, uh, of what needs to get done. It's built into to some of the tools that we, we are piloting right now. Uh, but uh, but I, we have kind of bits and pieces of DLP and other programs as well. And so it's, in my mind, another one of those elements that, that we need to rationalize where do we where do we you know manage DLP and how does that fit in uh, as we go forward? I think it's I think it's a, a something of an open question, and I guess I would I would sort of leave you with um, what we have right now for Thunderdome and for Zero Trust is not going to be where we end up, uh, and so so you know your your input will help us you know pick better and different tools as we go forward. We want it to be as simple as possible, but we, we know it's very complex. I tell everybody that I can that zero trust, that one of the things in the zero trust space is if, if somebody tells you that they can give you the, that with an easy button, they're lying to you. Uh, it's complex. There's many pieces to it. You see the seven pillars. You think about 150 some odd things that we have to do for the department. Uh, and so we need your help for us to find that right path as we go forward. And I have tons of good, smart people uh, at about five tables uh, in back here that are happy to talk to you on any one of these areas, and they're truly much smarter than I am. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Herman. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Caroline Bean, Director, Joint Enterprise Services Directorate. Hi, good afternoon. So I'm not Caroline. Um, I'm Martha Jasper. I'm Caroline's deputy, so unfortunately she could not be here today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about Joint Enterprise Services Directorate. Um, so really our overarching goal for, the, for really all of the capabilities in our portfolio is to be able to deliver high performance, mobile enabled, uh, resilient capabilities to our mission partners. So two, I guess, and keys to that, right, is one is being able to acquire solutions that and, and transform our business processes to really get full use out of those out of the box capabilities that industry has available to us. Um, and then second is really leveraging DevSecOps um, pipeline tools that we can use to deliver capability faster. But again, that's, that's um, resilient and, and really delivers um, the MVP, like everybody's mentioned, right? We wanna get capability out faster, um, but you know, do it smartly, do it the right way. Um, and then one running theme that you'll see um, throughout my briefing is modernization. There's a lot of modernization uh, activities going on in the portfolio. Um, so I'll hit on some of those as I run through the slides. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so first, our business systems portfolio. So um, this portfolio, uh, really the, the goal here is to deliver integrated um, systems that are for our internal, primarily for the internal uh, DISA customers, um, but one that I'll point out um, that's really for uh, customer facing or really mission partner facing is, is Marketplace, which is our modernization of DISA storefront. Um, so that's one of our high priorities in, in uh, business systems portfolio. The other uh, things that are listed here, you'll, you'll mainly note that are really for, again, internal uh, to the agency, but it really drives, um, or the importance of getting these right is really being able to drive efficiencies across the agency to do business better with customers, with industry, um, whoever our partners are that we're dealing with. Um, next slide, please. So this list here that you see is our, really our capability mission areas that we deliver to. Um, and some of the strategic focuses again. So, so we want to be able to, to modernize in, in, in all of this space, right? A lot of these systems are back-end systems, but that are really critical to being able to um, 
to deliver a better customer experience, not just to mission partners, but also again to industry partners and, and across the agency. Um, so what we, what we really want to be able to do is implement standardized configurations where we're really um, implementing out-of-the-box capabilities as much as possible and only customizing where it's absolutely necessary, right? So it's being able to transform our business processes so that we can make it easier for customers to do business with us. Um, that'll reduce our operating costs, that'll increase our customer uh, uh, user experience, um, it'll improve our data, right? give us more modern functionality across the business systems. Um, and then ultimately, again, the customer experience, that's got to be the number one thing that we're looking at um, and focusing on as we're building in um, modern functionality and, and delivering modern systems. Um, next slide, please. So this is the future state concept. So just a couple of things that I'll, um, that I'll point out to you is, first of all, we want to be able to make use and implement um, enterprise solutions, right, business enterprise solutions. So an example that's here on the slide is task management. Um, we don't want to recreate the wheel, right? If DOD has a tool that we can use, we're going to implement. Um, second, um, we want to use enterprise services, like a lot of things Dr. Herman mentioned, right? ICAM, um, things like that. Again, not reinventing the wheel, but making sure that we're aligning to agency um, and DOD enterprise services wherever possible. Um, the third area, so SAS and PASS. So again, I want to highlight, right, we want to use out of the box commercial products as much as possible uh, where we're just configuring the tools not reverse engineering them or doing something to them that they're not really meant to do right we need to change our business processes to take advantage of of those capabilities that are readily available to us um, to make it easier to, to not only sustain and manage the systems but to make it easier for customers to come in um, order what they need for example in marketplace um, and make it easier for those processes end to end across all these business systems um, so, so data management, and uh, data is a big uh, challenge for us, as others have mentioned. Um, I think in the area of business systems where, where the challenge lies is we have a lot of legacy backend systems. And so as we're modernizing, as we're introducing modern functionality, as we're bringing these data sets together, we're still dealing with legacy data that needs to be cleaned up and needs to be transformed. So I think that's a big area where we could use a lot of help. Um, we don't want to just throw new cool tools out there that, that say, you know, that claim to do data. We've got to have a good governance process in place um, to really get full use and full advantage of those kind of capabilities that are available to us. So that's, that's a big area, I think, where we can use a lot of help. Um, and then down at the bottom of the chart, um, so these are more sort of, I'll call them purpose-built type systems where, um, where it does require more configuration than probably some of the SAS and PaaS solutions. But again, we still want to continue to utilize um, industry uh, solutions as much as possible uh, where we can and not build anything ourselves. Um, I think the next slide I'll talk a little bit more about marketplace, but the big, um, the big ask there is that we are wanting to make sure that as we modernize the front end, right, where customers are coming in to place, to place orders for services or products from DISA, um, there's, a, there's a lot of modernization going on in the background, right, where as a customer comes in, puts in an order, there's a lot of back end systems for contracting, for financials, et cetera, that need to be modernized. Um, so again, data becomes a big problem and, uh, or a big challenge for us because we want to make sure that as uh, customers are, are bringing in information, we're reusing the data, right? We're, we're making it meaningful for decision makers and also for customers to, to know, right, from, from beginning to end, uh, the, stat, the status of their service, right, the status of, of how it is we're doing uh, in terms of operationalizing and giving them capabilities. So these are a couple of the, um, of the contract opportunities, um, specifically in, in the business systems portfolio. So the first one is for some of those uh, internal backend systems that I mentioned. And then the second one, ideas, is for our contract writing system. And on that one, what I will highlight um, is, is sort of a focus area, is making sure that we're making the appropriate um, upgrades to that system so that we fall in line with the business enterprise architecture. Again, driving at being able to, uh, to get the goodness out of the data that we need. Next slide. Okay, enterprise collaboration services. So um, the big one here that everybody will recognize is DOS. Um, but really the, the big driver here is making sure that we consolidate and better integrate voice, video, and data services across the portfolio. Um, so we've already started down that path. Uh, GBS, DOS, and our enterprise voice services are um, integrated to where you know, voice callers can participate and collaborate across those three different tools. 
Um, DOS is going to further um, integrate all of that with the delivery of DIPS, which is our um, the integrated uh, phone service. So what that's going to do is allow uh, folks that are in teams um, to be able to make phone calls, both commercial and DOD, uh, to both commercial and DOD phones. So that that's a capability that's coming in the near future. Um, and then the other highlight for this portfolio is over the next three years, we will we are planning to um, update our IP voice backbone um, soft switch technology to a more modern, you know, router-based infrastructure. So that's an opportunity that I think will be listed in the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so DOS. Um, so th DOS has three major components. One is um, the BPA, which is really volume, uh, gives us volume price uh, discounts across the department. Um, the second tenant is um, DOD 365 Joint, which is our, our uh, IL-5 tenant. Um, and then lastly, the one that's, that's coming soon is a DOD 365 SEC, which is our IL-6 offering. So that's going to be a cloud, um, also a cloud-based um, capability. Uh, we have started testing um, for that particular project, um, and we're anticipating being able to deliver an operational classified cloud um, in the third quarter of 23. Um, in the meantime, uh, it's not listed here, but DCS, which is one of our classified capabilities, as well as GVS, we will continue to enhance GVS. Um, D DCS, we do have plans to sunset that um, in FY23. Next slide. Okay, so these are a couple of the opportunities. I'm not going to read them to you, but um, the first is some engineering support for DOs, uh, primarily, um, you know, the two, the two pillars that I mentioned, uh, the, two, the, uh, the IO5 and the IL6 tenant. And then the second is um, hardware software support for our, one of our voice services. Next slide. I think this is a duplicate. Well, the top one is not. It's a, so this is the modernization that I mentioned to our IP voice backbone. Um, so we, we, that RFP is not out yet. It will be coming soon. Um, it'll be uh, second quarter of FY23, which is right around the corner. Um, and that'll be an effort, like I said, for over the next three years for us to be able to do that modernization effort um, for that backbone. And then the second, I think, was a duplicate from the previous slide. Okay, command and control. So our C2 portfolio, there's primarily two, um, two uh, programs that everyone's fairly familiar with, so GeeksJ um, and Jopes. So GeeksJ is our uh, joint operation and planning, planning and I'm sorry, JOPS is our operational uh, planning and execution uh, service. So that actually will be replaced by JPEZ, which is listed here in the slide. So that is the modernization of JOPS. Uh, for both JPEZ and GeeksJ, we are working on modernizing both of them um, to, to a cloud-based capability. Um, so what, in the, in the next slide, what uh, Geeks J provides is really it gives you, an, uh, it's the operational cop, um, and it gives you a bird's eye view of what's going on um, out in the field. And also, it, uh, uh, the way that it integrates with uh, JPEZ is that's the ability for uh, them to be able to do planning um, and be able to react to real world events. Um, the other two that are listed here, uh, EM uh, Enterprise Messaging, that's also another modernization that we're working on. Um, I, be, I, I don't know if uh, there's a contract opportunity listed for that one. I don't think there is, um, but it is an ongoing effort now um, that we are modernizing for that particular capability. Next slide. Okay, so this is a uh, sort of an overview of the two uh, programs that I listed again. Um, you know, GeeksJ, we are working on uh, web enabling. Um, that capability right now, it is a thick client application that, that we run. We are going to continue to sustain that until we give the a field an opportunity to not only for us to deliver the cloud-based capability, but then also to move everyone onto that capability. Um, the, the deliverable for that one is the first quarter of 23 is when we plan to field the first uh, software version of that, that system. Um, for JPEZ, the IOC is the third quarter of FY24. Um, and then our plans are to be able to sunset JOPS by the end of FY24. Next slide. Okay, and then these are some, uh, again, some opportunities uh, based on the previous slides. Um, next slide. So I think, so probably the one I want to highlight here is the, the last one, the command and control engineering IDIQ. 
So for this one, um, we really are looking for engineering support. And one of the things I want to hit on specifically is my comment about DevSecOps, right? We want to make sure that, um, you know, as we're rolling out these capabilities again, we want to take advantage of DevSecOps, uh, not only processes, but tools that are going to enable us um, to be able to do, you know, that, that agile, you know, develop, test, deliver, right, in the, in the MVP concept. Next slide. And I think that is a duplicate as well. Next slide. Okay, our uh, enterprise services portfolio. Um, so this portfolio is primarily made up of all of our mo mobility offerings that you may be familiar with, uh, DMUG, DMCCS, um, and TS. Um, one that I do want to highlight for you, because again, it's one of our big modernization efforts, is the DISA services platform. So uh, DSP is our is the way that we're going to deliver um, ITSM, ITOM, ITBM, which is IT business management, um, asset management, a lot of sort of those back-end business system type capabilities. Um, it is planned to be an enterprise service, um, not only at the agency, but potentially uh, a service offering to customers. Um, so, for, so for that one, we are looking again to do an agile methodology, right, being able to roll out uh, capabilities quickly. Um, over time. The, the big one there too is also the data problem that I mentioned before. Um, so what we're looking to be able to do is uh, we don't want to continue to duplicate data or to ask customers for the same data over and over again, right? We want to make full use of that information, but also being able to tie in um, operational data with business data so that you can really, um, you know, get after decision making, um, being able to deliver uh, new products and services that are going to meet, you know, tomorrow's mission needs but be able to do that in an agile fashion, you know, being able to deliver faster than we can today. Okay, next slide. So this is just a, an overview of our uh, mobility offerings. Again, as I mentioned, um, we, we offer uh, unclassed devices, secret and TS devices. Um, we partner with NSA on being able to deliver them in a secure fashion, meeting some of the CSFC standards. So those are some of the security standards we need to be able to meet. Um, we, we, do, we, do, we do the gamut of managing, not only providing the, the uh, devices, but doing the management of the devices in terms of security um, and the way that we wrap the devices to make sure that as you're, you know, stepping up in the security level, uh, we're maintaining, um, you know, cybersecurity as we, as we should. Um, on the left-hand side there, you'll notice a couple of the other systems that I mentioned. Again, just highlighting uh, the DISA service. Uh, platform as one of our key uh, upcoming modernization efforts. Next slide. So this one, um, this slide is, is uh, sort of the same as the previous. It just outlines our, our three different um, unclass, classified, and TS capabilities for mobility. Um, the, the, the one effort here that I would highlight is for our DMCCS, or, uh, DMCCS, we are working on the next gen devices that are going to be deployed. Um, so that's, that's a big modernization effort going on there. Um, and then also we're working on just mobility across the board on make, improving uh, the speed at which we deliver these devices. Um, so working with our team over in SD2 for Marketplace, um, upgrading and uh, the, the whole order entry um, for mobility specifically to make it easier again for customers uh, to place orders and to get, to, to get devices more quickly than they can today. Next slide. Um, so these two are a couple of our uh, upcoming uh, offers. So the first is a BPA for the devices themselves um, and some of the and some of the plans uh, for the devices. The next is an is a uh, is a continued support for our DMCC offering. Next slide. Um, and these same uh, the top one is for our for unclass support, um, and then the bottom one is to continue for continued uh, sustainment support for our uh, DoD Safe program. Okay, and that is my last slide. Any questions? Ma'am, we do have one question for you. How does an organization seek DISA sponsorship for IL-5 sponsorship for solutions currently deployed on-premise? Um, so we have uh, actually gotten that question before about, you know, what our view is on that. Um, so I, I think that, you know, work, we need to work together with RME or RME shop um, to be able to, to do a sponsorship like that. Um, you know, I think if you, have, if you have a capability that would fit the bill in any of the things that I covered, um, absolutely please come talk to us. 
um, and we can work with our RME uh, uh, part, uh, counterparts um, to see if that's something we can do. Any other questions? That was your final question. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Christopher Argo, Director, Defense Spectrum Organization. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Okay, super. Okay, uh, good afternoon. My name is Christopher Argo. I'm the uh, Director of the Defense Spectrum Organization. And so Mr. Martin is my boss. Uh, in the Digital Capabilities and Security Center. Um, I work clearly for DISA and I fall underneath really uh, LOE1, which is command and control. So I'm constantly trying to work on command and control uh, as far as electromagnetic spectrum is concerned. So here's my uh, mission and, and why and vision statement. But I'm just gonna start with my mission statement and that's deliver capabilities and expertise to empower DOD to solve tomorrow's electromagnetic spectrum challenges today. Okay, so that's what I come to work every day to do. And uh, what is important on this slide is my vision. And that is the vision that uh, the warfighter has freedom of action within electromagnetic spectrum when and where needed. And that means anywhere, okay? And that means really any DOD or a coalition commander who we might be supporting. So uh, that's what my guys do every day when we go to work and try to make that happen. So if we go to the next slide, I'm gonna to try to give you a DSO 101 uh, brief here real quick. Uh, but here are my lines of effort, okay? And the, you know, the purpose of DSO is to enable agile EMS operations. And I do that for, by providing spectrum access capability uh, to support EMS superiority. So if you look to the far right of that slide, you're gonna see the globe, okay? So uh, that's my domain, okay? EMS domain, uh, electromagnetic spectrum crosses all war fighting functions, okay? So it must be working across the board. And so if you see the very point of that tip, you're gonna see EMS superiority. And if you listen to Honorable Sherman today, that's not just EMS operational superiority, it's secure cyber security EMS uh, uh, superiority. So that's what we're driving for on a daily basis. And so we got three lines of effort uh, driving towards that goal, which are enterprise EMS IT solutions, engineering and an analysis services, and then joint electromagnetic spectrum support. Okay. So those are my three lines of effort driving towards that superiority. Uh, the, the first line of effort, that's really my software tools that I develop and provide for people to manage EMS and not just uh, for DOD uh, missions here. Uh, GEMSYS, you'll see the first one, that's the Global Electromagnetic Spectrum Information System. That's got a lot of items underneath it and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later uh, when I go to the opportunities. And next is um, EMBM. Many of you probably have heard of EMBM, but that's the Electromagnetic Netic battle management system, and that's a tool we're developing for JTF and combatant commanders that I will also talk about a little bit more later. Uh, a couple of items not talked about are the spectrum management coordination system, which I am developing to share spectrum with industry, as well as the telecommunications advanced research dynamic spectrum sharing system. That's called TARDIS, if you hear about that, but that's what we're using to share spectrum in the citizens band radio spectrum. And we just released that tool last week. So that's my first line of effort, providing capabilities for EMS uh, operations. Next is engineering analysis. Uh, we're looking at electromagnetic environmental effects here uh, for spectrum and how that affects uh, not only within the United States, but outside, especially uh, post camps and bases in the United States. Uh, the other thing I do here is international engagement and coordination, especially on the engineering side of the house. Uh, we participate in the World Radio Conference, which uh, takes place every five years, and we support all the efforts to, for, divide, for providing radio frequencies 
across the globe. And then finally, joint electromagnetic spectrum support. Uh, this is kind of a reach back, uh, you know, the 911 for EMS for DOD. Uh, we do that, uh, again, to achieve that EMS purity. A great example of us in this category is uh, we're currently working with Naval Special Warfare Group 4 for one of its platforms to ensure it's got EMS superiority on that platform. Pretty exciting, pretty uh, interesting thing to work on. Anyway, uh, so that's all driving to this EMS superiority. And uh, my whole goal here again is to enable joint all domain command control for the commander, okay? So when the commander makes a decision for something to happen, he doesn't have to fight through the EMS. He takes advantage of the EMS and he gets uh, ordinance on target, okay? Especially through those uh, uh, wireless systems. Okay, so that's, uh, that's DSO 101. I've got three organizations underneath me. I have a business management division, which handles all my human resources, finances, and contracts. I also have a, a, a strategic planning division, and they do all my international coordination. They do all the uh, spectrum sharing uh, with industry, which is you guys here, okay, and coordinating that. And then I have the Joint Spectrum Center, and they're kind of the war fighting guys. Uh, that we have here. They work with the combatant commanders to provide tools uh, to make sure that our uh, warfighters can use the spectrum when and where needed. Okay, so that's a quick rundown of uh, what I do here and what DSO is. Okay, so a uh, couple of opportunities that we have. If we go, yep, here we are. Make sure I'm on the right one here. Okay, this is my uh, EMS engineering and analysis contract. It is IDIQ. Okay, and that's where I was talked a little bit about the engineering that goes behind what we need to do to make sure things happen, okay? Uh, the environmental effects of frequencies we analyze here. Uh, we look at emerging spectrum technologies here. But this is, it's not just one division here. This is across the, across the board for DSO. So that's my IDIQ engineering contract. Next is GEMSYS. I mentioned GEMSYS a minute ago. That's Global Electromagnetic Spectrum Information System, okay? Now here are our tools, okay? Here's our software tools that we provide to users across the board, okay? Uh, some of you may be familiar with some of these. One in particular is Spectrum 21, which you see there, okay? Well, Spectrum 21 is what we use to manage frequencies across DOD. But not only is DOD using it, we also provide that to a lot of our coalition partners. And not only that, the National Telecommunications uh, Information Administration also uses it on behalf of the Department of Commerce to manage frequencies within the United States. So uh, th th it's quite a tool. Uh, it, it is, I will, I'm not going to say it, it needs to be modernized, okay? So that's one of an opportunity here uh, for you guys to help us modernize Spectrum 21. Also underneath GEMS is the Joint All Domain Command and Control Correction. My goodness, got ahead of myself there. Okay. <laughs> Joint Spectrum Data Repository, okay? Uh, that is where we uh, store all the frequencies used within DOD and make them available to units when they need them. So that's what JSDR is. It also deconflicts uh, 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 between units to make sure people aren't stepping on each other too close to each other, okay? And then next is end-to-end uh, -end security system. That is just making sure systems, just uh, radio platforms, are aligned with each other more than anything else. So there's a couple of opportunities on the GEMSYS side of the house. One great opportunity is it, it needs to be modernized, and we're working on the modernization process now. Okay, if we go to the next slide. Here's a, this is an opportunity for small business. This one is set aside for small business. This is my mobile service provider contract. And what this contract does, if, if, you, are, if, if you, industry, if you want to put a transmitting base station on a, uh, on a base, you have to go through this contract to do that. This does the analysis on the basis to ensure it's not interfering with any of the radar systems. It's not producing any radar hazards. And, uh, and that's pretty much what it does there, okay? But you've got to have that before you're allowed to put any, and there are towers on bases, just so you know, so it does work, <laughs> okay? So that's what this uh, does. 
And then finally, I'll talk to about EMBM, which is electromagnetic battle management, okay? Now, um, electromagnetic battle management for situational awareness. EMBM is be de being developed. It's an OTA process in four parts. The first part is situational awareness. And actually, I'm being very upfront. We're getting ready to release, release the first tool of it here shortly, okay? Uh, but this is going to be uh, the next iteration of the contract that we're working on right now. Uh, EMBM is designed to help commanders at the JTF and combatant command level to make quick, swift decisions to fight through the electromagnetic spectrum so they're not worried about it, okay? When they make a decision to launch ordnance or to tell uh, F-35 to go somewhere, that path is going to be clear and is going to be able to go, go and do what he's told to do. So that's the whole purpose of uh, electromagnetic battle management. First iteration is to give the commander the situational awareness on the EMS side of the house. Now, if you didn't know, quick lesson, uh, in 2020, uh, DOD signed electromagnetic spectrum superiority strategy, okay, and what that strategy does is, is forcing something that should have happened many, many moons ago, and that's for electronic warfare com community to work hand in hand with the, the spectrum community, okay? So we can't work separately anymore. We must work together. EMBM is going to help facilitate that working together and be a possible platform to help implement this uh, EMS superiority strategy, uh, which is the next version of what we're doing in the EMS side of the house. So uh, with that, that's all I have from the Defense Spectrum Organization on behalf of DISA, and I'm ready for any questions. Over. No questions for you, Mr. Argo. Thank you very much. Yep. And I think Mr. Packard after the break, right? Well, sir, right now we're going to take a break. And uh, we're going to take a 20-minute break. Please be back in your seats by 2.25 for Mr. Packard's presentation. Now, here's a reminder. Our program networking tables will be shutting down at 3 o'clock. So please be back here at 2.25 for Mr. Packard's remarks.
Ladies and gentlemen, the program will begin in five minutes.
Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome back from your break. At this time, please welcome Mr. Douglas Packard, Director of Procurement Services Directorate, and Ms. Deborah Daniels, Vice Procurement Services Directorate. <laughs> All right. I, I'm not Douglas Packard. That's Douglas Packard, so I'm Deborah Daniels. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. You know, it's the, towards the end of the day, and I think most people either out networking and the ones that really want to my, my standard crowd that wants to be here, appreciate my Ditko Scott folks and the team here. Woo -hoo! All right, you'll just wave and I got my own cheering section. But uh, <laughs> quickly, I'm Deborah Daniels. I'm the Vice Procurement Services Executive here for DISA for the Procurement Services Directory. So I'm preceding Mr. Packard. But I wanted to say welcome, even though we're getting down to the end of the day. For those that are here and those that are actually watching us virtually from around the world on this one, and to say thank you to you because you've heard throughout this as we've talked about partnership with industry it is if you look at this first slide these are our highlights from FY22 from the procurement services directorate and what we've done in DISA as far as acquisitions and contracting we don't do that alone we do that with you in conjunction with you it's the partnership with our small large business our industry partners to do that six and a half billion dollars almost six and a half billion dollars annually and as you've heard from all of our um, center directors, you've heard from the DOD CIO, Lieutenant General Skinner, the director. It is about partnership. So it's trusted partnership, your valued partners for us. Because like I said, 6.3 million supporting the depth and breadth of the department. As you can see, the numbers for all of the services that we've done this past year. So the major offerings and contracts that we've done for, for them. And as you look over here to the left, a lot of that is the contracting team that sits here that does that so some familiar names some familiar offices that we do that globally around the world on that that's a lot so we support all of the 10 combatant commands the 26 defense agencies if you go to the next slide and like i said this is definitely you can go to the next slide or i can probably let's not get me to touch this so i don't okay you can keep going that it's a build slide so one of my roles is the senior services manager. So it's the acquisition of services for DISA. You probably heard earlier, 85% of our portfolio is, is, is services. It's IT, cyber, telecommunications, 15%, you know, fall into some staffing, maybe some hardware, some other things like that. And if I can tell you all, you will get these slides. We will post the slides if we haven't posted them already out there. I, I wanted to make that announcement. But again, it's a trusted partnership. You're helping us compete, act, and when we can't do this alone and as we this is being a combat support agency we support across the DOD as you've seen and you've heard Honorable Sherman the DOD CIO main branch on us that we support the department as they try and optimize efficiency we do a lot of that we support not only DISA and DISA's requirements but all of the service requirements to other federal agencies so you're helping us try and keep pace with technology because we don't do it we don't invent and do that. So we definitely need you as the partner on that one. So we partnership. You've heard cybersecurity, cybersecurity, cybersecurity. First, foremost, and always. It's baked in, not bolted on, to make sure that you know, we've got that as a cybersecurity agency. We look to you definitely for the innovation, keeping up with the technological edge, because it's all about the warfighter, shooting, moving, and communicating, and making sure they've got the ability to do that. So innovative ideas as we're trying to do innovation. You've heard trying to do it agile, trying to do it faster. Not the 15-year solution, but you know the MVP, the six-month minimum viable product that we can at least get out there to keep them on the technological edge of this. Looking for the next generation solution. Delivering capability is what you're helping us do. You're delivering capability for us. Innovation, technology. This is what the warfighter needs, and this is what we in partnership with you are working to provide. We want to definitely leverage the technology solutions and that really multi-purpose solutions also. As uh, Lieutenant General Skinner has said, it's velocity, you know, doing it fast, doing it quickly, making sure it's the right solution, making sure we're agile, that we have, you know, innovation in the areas that we need to make sure our warfighters have the capability. 
And all of this, trying to do it with balance, because we've not only got to balance requirements, we've got to balance across the department, we've got to balance our own funding, got to balance our expectations, just to make sure that we've got the right solution, the right capability at the right time for the right moment on this one. And so, like I said, thank you to all of you for helping us with the solutions, helping the DISA get the warfighter the capability and the solution that they need so they can continue to shoot, move, and communicate. And you've seen just some of the things previously from our centers and our directors of what's coming up in the portfolio of where you can help leverage your resources to help us to get at the solutions that we need for the next coming years. And so as we look at the whole of agency approach, we also look at the whole of the department approach and trying to balance that. If you go to the next slide, I think these next couple of slides, as I said, I'm the senior services manager, and you heard Mr. Packard earlier, he was talking about category management. That's really one of the efficiencies in which we're trying to optimize our solutions to be efficient at it, where we actually have enterprise level contracts and solutions, whether they're ours for the agency level or their best in class solutions, because it might be a GSA schedule or Navy or some other entity that has a solution in place that we can quickly, when we talk about velocity and agility, to be able to order off of. These are the list of right now for the BIC in tier three and tier two vehicles that we are using or have in DISA. The tier means about how much we think we're gonna have spend annually on this. So across the department, you know, for a tier two solution, I think it's about, eh, estimated about 50 million annually. On, on spin from one of those solutions. So we've got at least a lot of contracts in place for our agency that we're using to help us get after solutions. We've created a lot of them that get after solutions that DISA needs itself on that. If you look at that at the bottom, the DISA enterprise vehicles and our tier one, two in the best in class vehicles. And we've got several in DISA that are in the best in class or tier three as you look at that and that's based on spin. The next couple of slides, if you go to the next slide, tells you basically the spin that's been associated with a lot of these solutions for the past three years. I think we've got, yes, FY20 to 22 on this from about the time of inception for a lot of these to where we're going for a lot of these uh, uh, solutions that we've gotten and that we use and we work to support us. So from JSP to DISA, and as you've heard Carlin Capino say, one of our policies definitely within DISA is it is small business first and we're coming up on a new requirement if we can at least get two small businesses that can do that requirement we'll reserve for small business if not then our next is definitely an agency or an enterprise level contract that we'd like to use because we've put these in place to meet DISA's needs and DISA solutions and if not then we also have other agency solutions that we will work to to use to support that $6 billion annually in requirements. If you can continue to scroll through, I think about the next three slides are telling you those uh, vehicle usage and trends that we have. Okay, then we went through that. All right, so the next couple of acquisition opportunities I'm gonna go through pretty quickly are for our external mission partners. So you've seen some of the things for DISA's needs. These are some of the mission partners that aren't here today that we're going through, and I'll just pick out a couple right now. So as you see, the project manager for positioning, navigation, and timing, there's a, 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 a requirement to support their planning and development and management sustainment. That RFP should be out somewhere around the second quarter. And then we've got an offering from the uh, Chief Naval Installations right now for its uh, command control and protection, so it's force protection and anti-terrorism requirements looking at about the fourth quarter. And if I might add, we do update our acquisition opportunity spreadsheet quarterly on it. So as I've gone through some of these and I've seen some today, life changes probably very quickly. So there's probably a couple of these that either the RFP is probably already out or something may have changed. So please keep up with our acquisition opportunities. Like I said, we try to keep up with it quarterly. And so as some of these, we've put this in place and updated these slides probably eh, somewhere a month ago. So they'll be updated at least quarterly on that one. If not, next slide, please. So again, from the Chief Naval Installation, we've got another two offerings there. As they come out either first quarter with that RFP has either come out somewhere, it's probably out there, it's either probably published right now since I don't have the dates on these, so please look for those. Go to the next, please. And then for DCMA, 
We actually have the records management tool that's coming up. Again, some of these in the first quarter, if the uh, RFP has not already hit the street, it is out shortly between, since we're what, what month are we in? November? Oops, November to December in there coming out, or we will have it updated again as we go through to publish our acquisition update in January again. And we also have just published in Signal Magazine when you'll start to see a lot of our contracts also, uh, a lot of our uh, enterprise level contracts, and you see the date of whether or not they're coming up for a recompete or the dates in which their periods of performance are listed. But I'm gonna go through quickly again. If you go through the next slide, okay. PEO EIS, again, that one's first quarter, but the Scott Cyber Support Contract for um, technology support for the 375th is coming up in the second quarter right now as long as, as, as well as another DCMA offering. You go through second quarter. Next. And as you see through this, most of our acquisitions are probably between three to five years out because I was standing in the back and someone asked why was capacity services 2025. You know, a lot of them we're getting them in the acquisition cycle because of what we're looking at on the requirement or who we've got to work with in order to get that in place are starting early. We're trying to move it a little to the left to make sure we can get an acquisition cycle early before something um, expires to kind of write through our requirement and engage with whoever we need to across the DOD battle space to make sure we've got the requirement right. So you'll see a lot of them are a little further out because we're trying to start our acquisition planning early. Okay, anything on here? A lot of these, so I'm gonna go through again. Just next slide, please. As PACOM comes up with its communication services support, again, for the fourth quarter, so a little further out in FY22, acquisition planning is actually in progress for that one, and you can see, again, most of those from the PACOM, and some of them have already been decided, at least on the strategy, that's going to be a set aside for at least small business. I was asked that earlier, so you'll see some of these for small business. Next slide, please. Okay, did that change? Okay, that did change. All right. Again, for the Commander Pack fleet, um, you can see that we're in first quarter there for that and the Pack AF one that are right now in its acquisition planning cycle and for the advanced artillery coming up around the second quarter. So like I said, I think that might be the last one for external. Go through one more for me, please. Okay, if not. As we can see, offering for the Air Force, again, supporting PACAF, and another one for PMPNT for its modernization uh, for its ground domain reserves coming up right now. That RFP will to be determined right now, but it's probably planned at least for an FY22 or FY23. But as it goes through, we would definitely have that one updated for you by the time we come out in January for our acquisition opportunities. This is just a snippet and probably what you have just seen from most of our centers as they brief their acquisition opportunities. We do have a very robust portfolio as we come out with that um, quarterly. Right now, it'll be published again in January. We do usually have it on our DISA.mil website. We're also working with our media group to make sure we can get it published on LinkedIn and other media sites. So probably part of that F2I box is if there's some place else that we're not tracking, that industry would probably would think would be a great place for us to post our quarterly update. I would appreciate that and any feedback on it. It's right now published as a, a searchable Excel spreadsheet. Like I said, it's pretty robust on everything that we're planning on doing between now and the next at least three to five years and has more extensive information than what you'll see here from the contract office to some of the um, uh, solutions or location for that requirement. So please check that one out, DISA.mil. It's under our events page if you go to DISA.mil right now. And I think we just published our last quarters and we'll be updating again come January. But this is just a snippet of what's coming up. So we'll ask you definitely to, to keep an eye out as we update that. And I think that is my last slide. Before I turn over to Mr. Packard, questions for me? Happiness, if I'm still around. Can I ask this? How many uh, businesses are from Maryland? That's from Maryland. Okay. Small businesses. How many? Okay, I see quite a few. Women owned? All right, nice. Hub zone. Oh, wow, quite a few on that. 8A? Quite a few. All right. Did I miss, did I miss any of my categories? 
<laughs> it's always interesting because um, I've met and I've taken the time to meet a lot of the small businesses who are getting on my calendar, and you've um, definitely talked and heard from Carl and Cap and us. So it's always nice to know the room and the, and the industry partners that are supporting us. I used to come from the SBA, so small businesses do have a place in my heart. But I like the fact that it's a wide span of just everyone that's supporting DISA. And as I've said, welcome and thank you to you because DISA does not accomplish its requirements and its support to the warfighter without you, without your capability, without your innovation, without your tech teams, without you bringing the solutions. We would not be able to allow that warfighter to shoot, move, and communicate as well as they do. So thank you for that. And again, I appreciate you attending this one because, like I said, it keeps our partnership going. So thank you. And I'm going to introduce Mr. Douglas Packard. He is the Procurement Services Executive for DISA. Don't go far. If there's questions, I'm gonna I'm gonna delegate. <laughs> so where is everybody? What happened? What happened? Oh, thank you. Did did they get the game? I mean, I, maybe I missed the, the bus. To... All right. Well, here we are. So Brian, as we talked about, man the door. Everyone leaves here. You get his ticket for a free contract. Just whatever contract they want. The guy right there, Brian Lada, new tech director. You love him now as a tech director, don't you? Right? Free tickets for a contract. I know who's going to award it because I can't sign anything, but so we'll leave it to Brian to figure that part out. <clears throat> so three topics I wanted to discuss. The first one, if you paid attention, this is a retread slide that Carl and Kapanos briefed earlier this morning, right? <clears throat> but the slide's important. I wanted to bring up, um, you know, what she does as for the agency. Is Carlin, is she in the room? I don't know if she... Oh, she's right there. And by the way, that was a small bus. I, Carlin said, threw it under the bus. It was a small bus, Carlin, right? Okay, or cars. It was a Volkswagen, not a bus. It was a Volkswagen Beetle. <clears throat> so this is a really good slide because, and she went through the details, but she went through five different, um, I call them denominators of how the considerations are made. Um, can the small business be successful? And she's one that can tell you, look, I've been doing it for a long time. As a kind of officer in the Ditko NCR, here's what I think where your odds are, given your business base, given your capability, given the fun you've talked to me. So she can give you the candid one-on-one -on -one dialogue that you need to have. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, next, she takes a look at with the KO about what we've done in the past, in the current year or past years, on um, the socioeconomic categories, small business set asides, large business, etc. Someone does look at us and kind of grade what we do as a as an agency within the department. Um, other socioeconomic categories, whether it be the small disadvantaged businesses, is, is is very much in focus the current administration. Um, previous year was hub zone, so those do kind of kind of guide an agency where they're going to go, right? Um, the third was policies, rules, regulations, guidance, laws, all that stuff, right? That all that all these carers carers ever deal with. Um, and then fifth was the distant premier contracts. As I say, every year we don't spend all that time to award those contracts to so put them on a the shelf and not to to use them. And so our focus this year is to have a first look at all those many SETI Encore, but there's others we have of those as first use contracts. So we award them for a reason. They're typically geared around our business base um, and who has maybe has done business with this in the past. It makes a very quick reaction to, to when it kind of gets awarded and General Skinner's thinking, oh, well, they're coming tomorrow to start performing. Well, no, they're new. They need a couple months, which doesn't work very well when I tell the warfighter, you need to wait a month for them to get staffed. So decisions she makes, <clears throat> but the most important thing is the bottom line on the slide. It tells you collaboration, KO makes a decision, they go to small business office, and then the last bullet is the most important bullet on the entire slide, probably of every slide she had. The small business administration concurs or non-concurs. So the Small Business Administration that has a cabinet level street seat in the administration to support small business tells us if we got it right. Remember that last bullet. If they say, we don't think you got it right, we ain't got it right, and they can push back. Uh, that's why the collaboration from the Small Business Administration, what the strategic um, alliances that Carlin has built with our um, PCR representatives, with SBA themselves, the programs that they manage, um, with the KOs, with the program managers, she makes all that work. So someone grades her homework on small business issues, whether we set them aside or whether we don't set them aside. All right, so I wanted to recover that as an important slide Carlin had. When I looked at her slide deck, it was phenomenal. So I told her I was going to steal the one slide from her. With that, let me go to uh, another fun topic, inflation. 
All right. So this won't be really good news for most of you, but I'll give you the department um, answer. So there's been two memorandums on um, inflation and how to address the under government contracts. Uh, the, the memo is the, the memo title and the dates on there. If you go to the public websites, you can easily find it within, within a Google. So as it'd be no surprise, if you've been in the business for a while, a cost reimbursement contract, even on our, on our ones we have, um, they, they don't really have ceiling rates when we do the IDAQs. Um, so those rates vary and what the cost of performance is is what we buy under a task order that's, that has cost cleanse. On a fixed price contract by doctrine, on a fixed price contract, the contractor generally, with a few exceptions, bears a risk of performance. That does not change when inflation comes up. That theory does not change when, but my labor pool is harder to hire. Generally, fixed price contract by doctrine and law the risk is on the contract, uh, is on the government. Totally different, um, it's on the contract, totally different when you have a cost type scenario. So with that as the premise, uh, what the department, the Director for Defense Price and, and, Defense Price and Contracting mem issued memorandums talk about, um, that's your benchmark that you'll judge it by. And absent a clause, we don't expect you to make up provisions that look like an EPA clause, which is economic price adjustment. So we caution us not to make those um, to call it um, a, what a word I can make up for them, but don't call it a mutual agreement to reform a contract that is nothing more than using a consumer price index to to um, to change labor rates maybe on a contract, right? So, and if you have an EPA clause, it's tied to an index. That index is contractually bound in the contract at time of award. The index doesn't change because the parties might have changed. Let's change it a little bit, right? So that's the doctrine of the department that was put out to all KOs within the DOD. Okay. I want to go to the, the next slide, and really, it just to really amplify the point. The second member came out, um, reminded KOs that they should not agree to a request for equitable adjustment submitted in response to changed economic conditions. It's basically a word-for-word -word quote from the memorandum from Mr. Teneglia. Next, there could be circumstances that you could reach a mutual agreement between the parties. And the, the, the um, example they gave within the memorandum was an acute impact on a small business or supplies. Um, but keep in mind what acute would be. Acute would be if a small business was going to be bankrupt, the government may choose an option to, use, to look at some type of um, kind of reformation through some type of EPA. But the first solution the department would tell you is, don't exercise the option, recompete it. On a fixed price contract, the contractual law is, is um, that the contractor bears the burden when the, when the award was made, right? And, and the department has not moved from that from the, um, from the procurement and pricing um, perspective. Um, if you did it, adequate consideration required. It could be, well, we agree that maybe you need more money for your labor rates. So for that, your delivery is accelerated by two months. Can't do it, but then there's no agreement. So the, so the consideration would be quite large, I believe, to even walk into a scenario where you have economic price adjustment to, to add that in. The last bullet is about the public law 85804. My typo, there is no period between 85.804. I look at the FAR so much as always two numbers, a dot, and then, then the subpart of the FAR. So that was my error. So it's public law 85804. What is that? If nothing else in the FAR applies, go do it under a public law. So over $75,000, I believe it is, or it might be seven, I think it's over $75,000. Uh, that, that adjustment would go up to ANS and the department, would not be my authority to approve that. So it's very high levels to use the 85804 uh, public law. Um, <clears throat> inflation is generally not found to be a need in the department to exercise 85804. Even a weapon system, they have not allowed um, the Army major commands to implement those. Um, we're talking the, the big ACAT-1 um, you know, missiles and, and tanks and ships. So um, not good news. I'm glad you stuck around to hear that not so good news on a Monday evening. But um, it kind of is what it is. And it, it goes back to government contract law is, is foundational. And that government contract law is, is what um, paces Mr. Nagley when he issues out the guidance. All right. Sorry, y'all. It is what it is. If we go to one last item, which is a little bit, I think, more informational, <clears throat> certainly informational from a, a DISA perspective. So defense, prior, prior, defense priorities and allocation system, the DPAS. You'll hear DPAS, you'll hear rated orders. 
So this goes back to in the um, around the World War II period. I think it was Truman, I believe, is when the law came out for our ability to get supplies and services that we need for national security and emergency preparedness for the United States. Read through the words, and I'll give you an example to use it that has happened in real, real case with Indessa. It happened under COVID. You know, COVID really, you can't even get milk, milk in the grocery store, much less trying to get, you know, other components when you have um, a very interconnected um, supply chain and you have um, pandemics and you have people not working, et cetera. Um, it's very, you know, it's a very much of a just in time. We were proud of a just in time supply chain. Made things work, made things cheaper. So what'd you get? You got a just-in-time supply chain that when a link breaks, you have your just-in-time supply chain that doesn't deliver just in time anymore, which is what happened under COVID. So read the words. So best example, DPASS and you have a rated order. Okay, so if I need a router for a tech refresh and routers are hard to come by, so the contracting officer does the order, they put a provision and then a clause in the contract with the order and they put in a second bullet, they put a DO, which is a rating code A7. A7 is electronic communication equipment. That is a rated order. That means when you get that order, you must fill that order before any unrated order and before every commercial order that's in your, that you're going to fill, okay? If you can't fill the, so by law, if you can't fill the order, and I don't know the number of days off the top of my head, it's either three days or seven days. If you cannot fill the order, you must notify the government. After that point, by law, it must be delivered, right? It must have priority, okay? So before COVID, I think within this a bit large, um, I know back in the day, back in my long day ago, um, everything was rated, every order we had was rated. It went into FASA fare, commercial items, it kind of fell out of vogue because you were buying things off the commercial marketplace, going into basically storefronts, quote unquote, and, and buying. So it kind of went out of vogue under COVID, it came back very, very big. So um, I had my phone and friends industry call up and saying, if you want the router, do a rated order, right? Well, that was new for DISA. We had that and done rated orders before that I know within DISA um, at all. So it's a little bit of a different learning curve. We've kind of mastered it now. Kenton officers can now, they can rate the order. You'll see more of those come out. They really come when a mission partner says, I need this order, and you know, this is supply chain issues, and they put it in the order. So it's not every order. If you get the order and it has that rating code on it, if you can't fill it within the delivery time frame and give priority to the Department of Defense, to DISA, you have to reject the order. We had an order for the Pentagon for something we needed the Pentagon. The contractor got it. They called up and said, we cannot meet the terms and conditions. We declined the order. Thank you. So we went to find the number two. The General Skinner asked, can they do that? Sure, sir, they can. They have the right to decline the order by law. They did it. We'll find a number two to provide. What do we do? We found other kind of vehicles, vehicles do the exact same work. So you'll see these pop out. I want to bring it up because you'll see these come out from um, from the DITCOs more often, um, given the supply chain issues. Um, but if you don't, if it's new to you in this industry um, niche, certainly go and, and have your Connex folks or have your um, legal folks give you the background, give you the law on it, and kind of lay out what the processes are. So those are the three items that I was going to cover. So we have a couple minutes, but as long as what you need. Any questions from the audience?